Well, I want to welcome everybody this morning. Amen. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. And mom, I mean, really and truly, I wrote it on your card, but I got to tell you, I'm thankful to you, mother. You've been a great mom. You really have. I was thinking about how uh, I don't always say it like I should. I don't. Probably not the best son ever, that's for sure. But I'll tell you this. Uh, I was remembering this morning when I was writing your little part about when we moved back from Singapore and how uh, I don't really remember everything that was going on, but I feel like it was probably a turbulent time of my life, of our lives. And I just remember one night when we were living in Northside Lafayette and we were in that living room in that apartment over there by when I was going to Acadian Elementary. And I just remember that I was having a rough time, I think. And then I just remember you being there for me. And I know that there were many other times, but uh, you've been a good mom and I appreciate you, mother. I love you so much, amen. Yeah, thank God that you were as sweet as you were because Lord, I've been a mess, man. If I would have had dad and not had your sweetness, oh Lord, thank you, mother. I love you. Love all you mamas, amen. Praise God. We're gonna talk about a mom. You know, listen, I gotta be honest with you. I think I probably preached on Hannah as a mother more than any other person. I think I preached on her last year. And I might preach on Hannah every single year for Mother's Day as we move forward because what I'm realizing, that maybe not, but anyway, what I'm realizing is that there's so much to this story that uh, you could keep adding flavor to, to it each new year. And I don't, I don't know that people listen that closely anyway that they didn't even remember that I preached on Hannah last year if I wouldn't have told you. But Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, I know that you placed a word on my heart. I pray that the truth of your word would come together and that you would minister to your people, Lord. There's people in this place today that maybe some people might have just showed up just because it was Mother's Day. But at the same time, I know that they're searching and I know that they're looking because life is painful, Lord. Life is painful and Lord, you are real and you are offering eternal life and you are offering hope for today. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, that you have your way. I pray that you would anoint the word of God. Lord, your word is already anointed, but I pray that you would anoint it, Lord God, and that you would allow it to have an effect in our life, Lord God. I pray that you would use me as an oracle or mouthpiece for your kingdom, Lord. I pray that you would allow the anointed word of God to enter into people's hearts, Lord God, and that it would effect change. You said it through the prophet Isaiah that your word would not return unto you void but that it would accomplish that which you sent it out to do. Amen? Hallelujah. So I've titled today's message, Prayers That Reach God's Heart and Move His Hand. I know, I know that for me personally as a believer, as a pastor, prayer has been really on the forefront of my, of my walk with the Lord over the last, I don't know, nine months to a year, it seems like. Prayer should always be a big part of our life as believers. Some of us have been men and women of prayer more than others. Uh, I'm willing to admit to you as a man of God, there's been seasons in my life where I've been a real prayer warrior. And then there's been other times in my life where I've been more complacent in my prayer life. I'm, I'm not a, proud of that, but I'm a transparent, pretty transparent guy. And so I'm going to, I'm going to just go ahead and divulge that to you. But, but what I do know is this, is that right now in my life, prayer is becoming very prominent in my walk. And I feel a closeness to God and I have an expectancy of my heart that God is going to do some great things, not only in my life, but in this church and in the people's lives that are part of this church. And I'm already seeing that take place. We're already seeing that take place collectively. And it's happening in different ways. We see it in our services, but it's even not just in the services. We've been seeing people move outside the walls of the church and being used in other people's lives. And we see, we're see we seeing people's lives, the, the Spirit of God springing up on the inside of them and bringing life to them. Amen. And the enemy's not happy about it. And I got to just break the news to you. He's not going to, it's not like he's going to get less happy. Happy as each day moves forward. If you remember the messages that I preached here recently on Nehemiah and building the wall, and we talked about Sanballat and Tobiah, whenever they heard, whenever they were they were the enemy, they were a type of the enemy in that story. When they heard that the work of God was moving forward, the wall was going to be built, what 
out. They became grieved. They became angry. They tried every manipulative tactic that they could come up with to try to get them off the wall. And I got to tell you something, child of God. The enemy is not going to quit. He is unhappy anytime God's people are willing to stand up and to believe God that he can do a work in their life and he wants to do a work through them. And anytime a child of God is willing to yield their spirit to the spirit of God to be used as a vessel, the enemy is going to get angry. Right. He's going to try to cast the spirit of heaviness on people. He's going to try to cast the spirit of infirmity on people. He's going to try to cause people to be frustrated and irritated. But I got to tell you, he don't win. And he's not going to win. Hallelujah. Because Jesus Christ has won the war. Amen. Now the Lord is asking us to join him in the battle. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but I'm ready. I want to join the Lord in the battle. Amen. Amen. And it's not that I don't go through heavy times myself because I do. Amen. We all do. But praise God, he that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. And by the grace of God, listen, there's dark times in this country. There's dark times across this world. News flash. I don't think anybody's not aware of that. And it's going to get darker. The Lord's already spoken that to me. And anybody that's read the Bible already knows it. It's going to get darker, but you know what the Lord's saying is this, is that he's going to pour his light out. He's going to pour the oil of his presence out. He's going to wake his people up. The Lord, Lord, I call upon you to wake up your people. Not just in this church, not just this pastor behind this pulpit, but pastors behind every pulpit in this country. And let this country be set on fire by the Spirit of God. And let this country be a starting point for the fire of God to move across this globe. Let a wildfire take place. Give us Pentecost, Lord. Hallelujah. We didn't just come to new church. No, we came to call upon the God of Elijah. Oh, that he sent fire down from heaven. Hallelujah. So I'm sorry, mamas. You're going to get your due a little bit today, but it ain't all about you, my friend. It's about the God who answers by fire. It's about him who sent Jesus, hallelujah, to die on the cross for our sin. And Hannah. Man, praise God, Hannah. Man, you know her name means grace. When you start to see the story, I'm going to read a lot of scripture this morning. I hope you're okay with that. Paul told young Timothy, pay close attention to your doctrine. Pay close attention to the public reading of scripture. I hope you're okay with us reading scripture this morning. Amen. But I do want to talk to you a little bit before we get into that. Look, I'm going to start with 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 2. He said, and he had, his name was Elkanah. That was the, that was the husband. He had two wives. We're not going to get into that this morning. Is it God's will? No, it's not. This is the way. No, it was not God's will, but this is where we are. Right? And he had two wives. The name of one was named Hannah. The name of the other was Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. So before we get moving in the rest of the scripture that I want to read, I want to talk to you that within the pages of this story, desperation for a move of God is the story of Hannah's life. Yes. The weeping prayers of a barren womb wake the pages of the opening chapters of 1 Samuel. It is certain that when God sees a willing heart to pray or to partner with his purpose, he will lay a burden on that heart to pray according to his will for his kingdom. Let me say that again. When God's eyes roam from heaven, and it does, the word of God says in Isaiah 66, that his eyes are roaming to and fro, and he's looking for that which has a contrite spirit and trembles at his word. And when, he, when his eyes light upon that type of a person, I'm here to tell you that he will place a burden on people's hearts like that. Well, I don't know if I want to serve that God. Why? Why would he place a prayer? Because he's looking for somebody that's going to partner with him. So if the Lord begins to put a burden on your heart and you begin to find yourself crying out to God for things that you don't even understand why. Then, then you may be, you may have been visited upon by the Holy One of Israel, by the Ancient of Days, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and He's calling on you not just to put a baby in your belly, but instead to partner with Him for a bigger picture of His kingdom business. Right, yeah. See, I can tell you that I believe in the story, and as I read it a little more closely this time, that Hannah, she didn't understand everything that was going on. But God saw a willing heart 
And we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we go forward. But I want you to know this. He'll lay a burden on the heart to pray yes, according to his, his will for his kingdom. She did with the burden. What believers are supposed to do. I want you to understand that. If you're a believer this morning, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and, and the Spirit of God lives in you, well, how do I know if I'm saved, preacher? I was in vacation Bible school one time when I was nine years old, and the preacher said that if I raised my hand and pray a prayer, then I would be saved. Let me tell you how you know you're saved. And this is what I believe. This is what I believe the Lord has shown me. And I'm going to give you some scriptural evidence for it. The word of God does say that. It says, if you will believe with your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Can I tell you this, though? There's a difference. Sometimes it's tricky. It's tricky, tricky that our mind, we believe with our mind, but never with our heart. And we believe that we believe with our heart when we really may have only believed with our mind. When you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth the truth of the gospel, you know what happens? The Bible says in Ephesians 1 and 13, it says that a down payment of the spirit is given to you. The earnest of the spirit. When you heard the gospel and you believe, guess what happened? The Holy Spirit deposited himself in you. And it's a down payment because there's more to come. And so when that down payment of the Holy Spirit lands in your heart, guess what? You won't ever be the same. Or you might try to run. You might try to hide. You might take a little sabbatical, but I'm telling you right now, you'll never be the same, my friend, because the Holy Spirit is going to contend with you. And if you've never felt that change, if you've never felt that burden lifted, if you've never felt that cleansing of your soul, then it's possible you've never been saved. I'm a good preacher for telling you that. Because see, if you die today or tomorrow and your soul was not saved because you did not truly believe from your heart, I'm telling you what the Word of God says. Then that means that you may have rejected the only one that could have ever saved you. His name is Jesus. That's why we cry, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lamb. That's why we sing, No longer a slave to sin. I know I can't sing, but hey, that's why you got a song in your heart to sing such a thing. Because God sent him to set us free. And so I hope and pray that anybody watching or anybody in this place, that you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I love it when people come to the altars and bow their knee. I love it when people sob and weep in the presence of the Lord. But can I tell you something? It ain't even got to be like that. It can be you and Jesus alone tonight at the foot of your bed when nobody else is around. And if you want to turn the light off, you can turn the light off. And you can do business with the Lord. You can get down on your own knees in your own room. And you can sit there and you can call upon the name of God. And you can invite him into your heart. And you can ask him to do business with you. And he will move into your heart. And he will change your life. Is it all going to get better from then forward? Come on, man. The devil's going to try to attack you. That's right. The devil was trying to attack Hannah in this story. He was trying to make her feel hopeless in the midst of this story. And she did what believers were supposed to do. She began to cry out. She fasted. She travailed. She travailed in prayer. And her prayers reached God's ear. And they moved his hand. Yes. Miracles are conceived in heaven when a person's prayer intersects with God's will. Oh, man, that's a good. Miracles are conceived in heaven when a person's prayer intersects with God's will. Hallelujah. Listen to me. Well, sometimes we pray. The word of God says you, you, you do not have for you do not ask. And you, when you ask, you ask amiss because you ask out of your own lust of your own heart. The Lord wants us to be praying according to his will and that his will would be that his kingdom would be established on this earth. And in the midst of that, souls would be wanted to the kingdom because I got to tell you, man is down here trying to build his own kingdom. Preachers are trying to build their own kingdom. People sitting in churches are trying to build their own kingdom. And the enemy, sure enough, is trying to build his own kingdom. But God's got a plan. Yeah. Hallelujah. And he's looking for some people that are partner. He's looking for some people with a heart like Hannah that he can lay a burden on. And that with that burden, they'll begin to cry out. They'll begin to travail. They'll fast. And that they will pray that God's will would be done. And her prayers reached. And it moved the hand of God. Amen. His will always surrounds saving his people for, for the purpose of establishing his kingdom. And this story is no different. Her heart longed for her empty womb to be filled with life 
And God's heart longs for heaven to be filled with people. That's right. I can't really get that across enough. And if that's not good, we just soon shut the book and go home. And I don't mean to be ugly. I'm just being real. If that's not what we want, if we're looking for God to do something different, then we're missing the whole picture because he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all these other things shall be added unto you. I believe with all of my heart. Have I seen every prayer that I've prayed for my own family come to pass? No, I have not. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tighten up my belt. I'm going to click up the seatbelt. I'm going to keep on seeking God. I'm going to keep on calling out to the Lord. I'm going to keep on crying out to the one that I know can do it. Amen. And I'm going to keep on partnering with Him and communion with Him to, to strap up and to do His work. And I'm going to believe and until I see it, I'm going to trust Him because He's trustworthy. Yes. And I believe that God is sovereign yes. and that he is in control. Yes. And that even if the sparrow falls to the ground, he knows it and he knows how many hairs are on my head. And I believe that God is bigger than my problems. Yes. And I'm going to keep on hoping and trusting in him. She was a desperate woman. And she was living in desperate times. And just real quick, a little bit of a Sunday school lesson. She was living in desperate times, the time frames of the judges. Now, many of you have been Bible students for a long time, and maybe some of you have not. So let me just give you a little bit of a quick lesson so we can understand. Let's start at the Exodus. You've heard the story of the Red Sea. I think the one of the songs sung about it. You split the water socket, walk right through it. At least it used the word there. Right? The children of Israel had been slaves in Egypt for 400 years, and the Lord sent the plagues, and he led his people out. After the blood of a lamb was painted on the doorpost and the side post, a perfect type of the blood of Jesus that delivered them out of the world and brought them into towards the promised land. Amen. And so they left from the Exodus, but then they wandered for 400 years in the wilderness. And you remember that Moses died and who brought him in? Joshua. What a beautiful play. You can't make this stuff up, my friend. Joshua is the Hebrew variant of the word Jesus. It means Yeshua, it, it, Je, Je, that Jehovah saves. Jehovah is salvation. God used Joshua to bring the children of Israel into the promised land that he had planned for them. And then Joshua died. The judges are 400, about 430 years of a time frame after Joshua before the first king. That's right. And during the time frame of the judges, wickedness prevailed. God's people, called by his name, repeatedly, can we say it different? Rebelled against him? Yes. Cheated on him? Yes. Went after false gods? Did things that they weren't supposed to do? Right? And, and, and in the time frame of the judges, and you'll see it before we're done. And why do you always preach like this, Pastor. Because the word of God keeps repeating itself and I'm just preaching the word of God. I'm pre because you know why? Because I was in a barroom bathroom in 2001 after my sister took her life. Did I tell you all that story? I know I've told many of y'all that story, right? But let me just remind you why I do what I do. Because I was in a ballroom, mine, like, like just living my own life after being a Christian, a mediocre Christian at best for 12 years, and going back and to, to drown my sorrows, going back like the children of Israel, going to head back to Egypt. Oh, I miss the watermelons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. I'm going back to Egypt because, oh, look at that. No, no, no. You know what the Lord did? The Lord showed up in the stall of that bathroom, and he grabbed a hold of my heart. He said, listen to them. They need me. They all need me. And look at you. I can't even use you. And you've always been willing to tell people about me, but only in a way where you can still look cool. No, you'll lay your life down before me and you will present my word for the way that it is written. And then I will use you. And it took me a long time to figure something out. But let me tell you what I figured out along the way. There was already a bunch of people that were presenting the word for the way it's written. And let me tell you something else. I'm just a man and I'm still learning. I'm still learning and I'm still praying, Lord, because I'm realizing right now over the last year, I thought I had something figured out. He's showing, he's opening it all up all over again. He's saying, son, you just scratching the surface. I'm about to show you things in my word and I'm about to make some connect some dots and you started with the right foundation, but you better keep on moving and you better keep on going. Hallelujah. And you don't even know what it means to lay your life down yet. But we're going to work on it together, and I'm going to use you. He's already been using me, and hallelujah, I believe he's going to use, you, use me more. And he's going to use you, and he's already using you. The time is short, church. The days are growing dark, and there's no time for playing church anymore. 
And that's what we need. We need a move of God to move on our hearts and to get us together in the unity of Christ. And that's what this church is going to be about. Whether it's small, whether it's big, it's going to have to be people that were willing to buy in to what the Word of God says. So that's why I preach it that way. Because that's how it's written. God, and listen, I want to share it. I'm going to say it a little bit more clear in just a second. But if you read the Bible all the way through, and I don't need a show of hands. But if you've ever read the Bible from cover to cover, I've been through the Bible from cover to cover a few times. And the first time I ever did that was way, way, way many, many years ago. When the, back, back in 02, after that incident. And I was like, oh my gosh. In the Old Testament, all of these things that are happening are Matt's life being played over and over. And the book of Judges is even more so. In the book of Judges, the people of God repeatedly up, down, up, down, up, down, yep. rebellion, finding themselves in misery, crying out to God to have his way in their life. He saves them. He rescues them. What? Rebellion again. Crying and then finding themselves in bondage, crying out to God. It's not supposed to be that way in the New Testament, Christian. It's not supposed to, and listen, let me tell you why. Because Jesus has died to give us access to grace. Right. And grace isn't just forgiveness. Grace is power from God and divine influence on the heart and its reflection in the life. That's the definition in the Greek language. A divine influence. Who's divine? God is divine. Influence on your heart, your inner man. God, grace is an inside job, my friend. You can't work it till you get it right. You have to yield yourself to God, surrender yourself to the will of God, to the work of God, to the work of the cross, of what Jesus did on the cross to deliver you, not just to forgive give you but to deliver you from the bondage and the power of sin yes. hallelujah yes. <laughs> and, and, and if we will yield to that and if we will surrender to that we will experience grace from God and empowerment from God from the Holy Spirit to be strengthened to be able to walk with God she was a desperate woman living in these times and in the time, let me just say, say this about three times in the book of Judges, it said this, there was no king and the people did what was right in their own life. You may not see the Bible this way, but this is exactly how I see the Bible. The Lord showed me this whenever I used to first was studying the Old Testament as God was doing the work on me. He says, look at this, son. Israel as a collective people were my people. I've shared this with you before, but I'm going to keep sharing it with you so you understand when I'm teaching the Old Testament how I'm really viewing this, how the Lord showed me to view this. And I've told the story before, but when I lived in Lafayette, I was a young boy. There was two boys that moved into a neighborhood that I used to go hang out with my friend. Two brothers. One, the older brother's name was Israel. The younger brother's name was Christian. I forgot about them dudes. Now I started reading the Old Testament <laughs> however many years ago, and the Lord said, my people are like them boys that you knew, Christian and Israel. Israel's older brother, Christian's little brother. Israel, a collective body of people wandering in a wilderness <clears throat> with a tent, a tabernacle in my presence, being led by a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night, harboring the presence of God as a collective group of people. Now, Jesus, the word became flesh and dwelled. The word in the Greek means sanctuary. He sanctuary with us. The literal presence of God in Christ. And now those that believe in him, they now did you not know that you are the temple of God. And so not only are you the temple of God when we come into this stationary structure and we bring the presence of the Lord with us. We're the tabernacle of God because when we leave out of this place, the presence of God is going to be on the inside of us. And everywhere we go, we're going to bring the presence of the Lord with us. So I want you to understand that when I see the Old Testament, I'm seeing Matt Abair right up in there. Other people may tell you, oh, no, you got to leave the Old Testament alone. You got to leave the law alone. No, 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 no. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Jesus said this, if you love me, what did he say? Keep my commandments. Well, how am I going to do that, Lord? Because Jesus died on the cross. <laughs> he, he, he paid the debt of sin. The Holy Spirit lives in you. And there's a release of grace yes. to empower you. Yes. To be obedient. Yes. 
to the will of God. The, you know what our problem is? Sin's already been crucified. This is not my message. I know I got to get moving. Sin's already been crucified in Christ on the cross. The problem of sin has already been dealt with. You know what the problem is? Can I be honest with you? Oh, yes. I'm going to say our flesh. We refuse to surrender our flesh. I'm, I'm talking to those of you that got struggles in your life. I'm trying to help you. We let everything get in the way of the Lord. We got idols in our life. Spouses, music, drugs, alcohol, other relationships. Do I have to keep? They're idols. Yeah. Well, what are you talking about? I don't have Mary in my front yard, but you just soon put Mary in your front yard. I don't even know where all this is coming from, but you just soon put Mary in your front yard because an idol is anything that places itself between you and God. God's here, the idol's here, and it stands in between you and the Lord. So whatever it is in your life that you got all your time and your attention and your focus on, instead of it being on him, is an idol in your life. And it's got your eyes off the Lord and it's got your eyes on something else. And if you keep on letting it live its way in your life, you're never going to be able to make the connection to God that he's wanting you to make to him. And he wants you to know this morning that he's already brought deliverance. And if you'll trust in him and hope in him, he will bring the deliverance and make it manifest in your life. That's right. Hallelujah. And so Hannah was she was given this bird and she was a desperate woman in the midst of desperate times. At the time frame of the judges, it was a time whenever there was no king. And I see that as a type of the church now. You, you understand what I'm saying? You can find types of the church throughout the Old Testament. One of the first ones I ever saw, and again, I know I'm kind of going on, this is not in my notes, but I want to make a point. Whenever the children of Israel, you remember the story of David and Goliath? Y'all probably heard me say this. The story of David and Goliath, if you, let me just tell you real quick what happened. David showed up, you remember that? He brought wine and cheese to his brothers. And you know what he saw? He saw, the Bible says that Israel was in battle array. Shouting the war cry. So that means that they were dressed up. They had their Sunday best on. They were dressed up. And they acted like they were ready for war. Yeah, yeah. They were like, ah! See, that's what we used to do before football. We slap each other in the helmet, grab each other by the face, and ask coach and hit you on the back side. Come on, boy, get in there. Ah, ah, get ready for war. Ah. So they're all dressed up and they're ready and they're shouting the battle cry and they're ready to go. And then David just happens to walk up and then old sleepy Goliath stands up and he starts yelling across the valley of Eli at him. And he says, why don't you send some over here to fight? And they all start cowering. Then it's all of a sudden the atmosphere changes. And, and, they, and young David, like, he don't even know what is going on. He's going to deal with this uncircumcised Philistine. He's not even in covenant with the God of Israel. What are y'all doing cowering in the camp? And, you know, to make a quick story short, I mean, a long story short, in the end, I'll never forget what the Lord recently showed me. When David goes over there and he starts telling the story to Saul, I noticed that for the first time. Listen to me. Y'all don't try to write that book because I'm going to write that book. David's sitting there with the head of Goliath in his hand the whole time. I'm talking about victory, my friend. I'm talking about David as a type of Christ, and I'm here to tell you, don't let the devil lie to you. You have victory over the lying devil because Jesus has already defeated him. You and I got to learn how to walk in the victory that Jesus has already won. But what the Lord showed me about the church is this. That's my church, son. Oh, they all dressed up. They all dressed up. They hooped and they hollered. And boy, look, on Sunday, they ready to have church, but Monday through Saturday, Ain't nobody really living for me. The same thing that whenever I went out there, by the grace of God, me and Brother Bill, we were able to minister. And Julie and Pamela behind us, whenever we went out there from Mardi Gras uh, to, to preach Jesus. And the Lord just gave it to me in my heart. I know I've said it many times, and I'm sorry I'm redundant and repetitive. But multiple people after person after person. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I, you know what? I don't care anymore if I bring conviction to people's lives. I'm not trying to irritate people. I'm, honestly, I'm not. I promise you that. I want to live for Jesus, and I know that drugs and alcohol are destroying people's lives. Come on, right. yeah. Come on. 
And I go out there and they're sitting there. I didn't say one thing to them about them not loving Jesus. I ain't said nothing about that. I walked up, Bill's carrying the cross, and I said, hey, what do you think about Jesus? We're just out here trying to remind people about the goodness of God. Well, I, I love Jesus. I, and, you know, and they're holding, they're holding their brewski. I love Jesus. And but I mean, I just do a little something, something, whatever. I didn't even come here to talk about that. But I will tell you this. I don't question whether or not people love Jesus. Everywhere I go, people tell me they love not every single person. But they ain't nobody serving him. And that's not nobody serving him. Some of you people are serving him. But what I'm trying to say, you get the point I'm trying to make. Yes. Is that people are saying that they love the Lord. God's looking for people to serve him. Yes. God's looking for people that he can partner with to actually do the work of the kingdom. Yes. Hallelujah. Not the work of just what we believe that we want a blessing from God. No, no, no. He's looking for somebody to partner with him. And so let me, let me get on with old Hannah here. So that, that was the church. All they hooped and hollered. The church also, during the time frame of the judges, ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs. The church in the wilderness, wandering, wandering in the wilderness. Not just the church, but your life and my life. I can talk about it because that's been me. Hooting and hollering on Sunday. Wandering in the wilderness. Ups and downs. Lord, please forgive me. Set me free. Oh, I'm in bondage again. That's not normal Christianity, my friend. Jesus died to give us victory. And I don't know about you, but I'm ready to walk in it. Amen. Hallelujah. And so, Hannah had a heart for God and his will, but her heart was broken and she needed a move from God. And during this time, God's heart was also broken. I want you to know that. Her request was that God would give her a son, but her promise was that she would give that son back to God. I mean, you see these repeated concepts over and over again. A barren womb. Sarah's womb was barren. Samson's, Manoah's wife's womb was barren. Uh, super, you know, supernatural births coming forth to bring forth a, a, a man child that God could use. To bring forth uh, his work upon the earth. Amen. And so she's over here. Her request is that God would give her a son. Her promise was that she would give the son back to God. And while these time, the time frame of the judges is marked with rebellion and disobedience of God's will. Of, of God's people against his will. It's a time when his own people stopped their ears to his word. Society then was similar to the way it is now. No king. They do what's right in their own eyes. Hophni and Phineas, or Hophni and Phineas, however you want to say their name, I'll introduce you a little bit more to them as we read the scripture. They were the sons of Eli. He was the high priest, and they were operating as priests in the house of God. And, and it's unlikely that the rebellion against God by Hophni and Phineas is, is surpassed by any other character in the Bible. I mean, you may be able to find some people that are right there with them, but you're going to have a hard time finding somebody that's worse than Eli's boys. Hophni and Phinehas that were acting as priests in Israel, in Shiloh, during the time frame of the judges. And, and they, 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 they were supposed to be leading God's people, yet they served themselves and they performed their own will instead of God's. And the more I study God's word, the more I realize that God has to repeatedly deal with this type of behavior from his people. I don't mean to be negative. I know you came into the house of God to be encouraged by his word. And I hope and believe that before it's over with, you will be. Hallelujah. But I also feel as though the Lord is showing me what he feels when his people rebel against his word. And how this isn't something that happens only every now and then. Instead, this is something that repeats itself throughout the Bible's pages and repeats itself throughout our own lives. God's heart is broken by the rebellion of his people. Jeremiah 5.30 says this, and a, this is another time frame. This is later after the judges. This is during the end of the kings. Jeremiah the prophet says this, an appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests rule according to their own direction. And my people love 
to have it this way. But what will you do when the end comes? I believe that this is the condition of the modern church. I'm not trying to say that there's no good churches. I'm not trying to say that there's no good preachers. As a matter of fact, I'm starting to find out that there's a lot more than I realized when I had that old critical spirit that was blinding me. But I will tell you this. There's a lot of false prophets. There's a lot of false teaching. There's a lot of, and sometimes it's purposeful and it's trying to trip up people. Sometimes it's on accident. But I will remind you of one of my Bible professors when I worked on my degree. He's, this is what he said. I'll never forget. It was a VHS. I had that tape in there. He said, it does not matter whether a preacher preaches the word of God in error on purpose or on accident. The result is the same. At least a bondage instead of freedom. And the enemy wants to, this is not something new. The enemy has been creeping in amongst the people of God. And he's been causing diluted truth and false things to be spoken that cause God's people to live substandard to what his plan for their lives are. And sometimes it's something as simple as a works-based message. Preachers have not even taken the time to study the letter to the Galatian church to realize that Paul was constantly having to combat a works-based message. And yet still today, preachers stand by my pulpits and it sounds good. It sounds right because they tell you all the things you're supposed to do in order to gain freedom. And they tell you everything other than simplicit, sim simple, pure devotion to Christ Jesus. Amen. Simple faith in Christ Jesus right. and everything that you do to lead you back to simple and pure faith in Christ and what Christ has done. And instead, we take the object of our faith. We take our eyes off of Christ and we put it on the things that we do. You know, one of the things I'll tell you about this church right now, we've been in the midst of a fast. I don't really, and I ask people to fast. I'm not trying to be legalistic. I told y'all if y'all fast one day, one day's better than no days, right? And we're just doing a fast from six to six and eat, some people do more than other people. I hope I'm not asking for a show of hands because that's your personal business between the Lord, but I know what the Lord told me. And, and let me just say this. If we want God to move, do, do we want God to move? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Bill. Do we want God to move in the midst of our sanctuary? Or let me just ask this question. Are we okay with what we've got so far? I'm, I'm not. I'm just being real with you. I'm not trying to tell you that you can earn it. But I will tell you this. If we want to move of God, it's going to require that we seek the face of God. And the more we seek the face of God, the more the spirit of God is going to respond. You're not earning it. You're learning it. And, and, and I'm just saying that I believe in prayer and fasting. I believe in reading the word of God. I believe in presenting the word of God for the way that it's written. But I got to tell you right now that if you start putting, taking your eyes off of Jesus and what he did for you at the cross, not just for salvation, but also for victory over the power of sin. And you start to put it on how much Bible you read, how much you go to church, how much you fast, how much you read the Bible, how much you pray. And you make that an idol in your life. Then you're now frustrating the grace of God and you've turned the work of Jesus where your faith should have been into the work of your own flesh and you just took something that was beautiful the word of God prayer going to church and you turned it into a work of the flesh and you frustrated the grace of God yeah. so that's not what we teach here that's right. Yeah, that's right. but these kinds of things have been going on in the church for a long time and that's just one example I could go on and on about other false doctrines and things that are all over the airwaves and, and I don't really have time to do all that right so let's keep going before we get into the story, though, well, I wanted to say this. Thank God. You know, at times uh, uh, we, we have all directly disobeyed God's word. I think everybody can admit that, right? You don't have to raise your hand. But I think that each person in this place can admit that there's been a time in their life that the Lord spoke something to them and that they directly disobeyed either the written word or the whisper. Boy, that whisper is a beautiful thing, huh? How many times have we been whispered to? Y'all know what I'm talking about. See, I don't know about you, but I love that whisper. And I want more and more of that whisper. 
And one of the things the Lord's recently shown me, you want me to whisper, but you can't even obey the written. You can't even obey, obey what I wrote on the pages and you want me to whisper more. You, you see what I'm saying? He says, I know that we I know that we've all done this. I was just sharing my testimony with Lily the other day. She could she she texts me, she said, I want to hear your testimony. So I, you know, I, I love to tell them my testimony because I like hearing other people's testimonies. I don't know. Do y'all like to hear other people's testimonies? I love hearing people's testimonies. So I'm like, oh yeah, let me tell her my testimony. So I go outside, I call her up, and I start telling her my testimony. I went all the way from the back to the front. Oh, I forgot to tell you. And you know what? After I got off the phone. Well, actually, when I was done, I was like, man, I really disobeyed the voice of God a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it came out like that this time, but that's just how it came out. <laughs> and I was like, man, God spoke to me so many times, and, and I didn't listen. And I don't want to be like that no more. Amen. I want the grace of God to speak to me, and I want him to give me the power that I need to obey. Because if I'll do that, I believe with all of my heart that he'll speak even more. Amen? Amen. And so Hannah's weeping and fasted prayers for a son. They crossed God's ears at a time when he needed a pair of ears to hear. That's kind of how this message came back to Hannah. Because it was Mother's Day. And on my heart, the Lord had placed on my heart the fact that there's many times that God's people and even myself have not listened. And this is a story of when God needed a pair of ears. If, if I, the Lord will give me grace and I make it through this message, I'm going to make some connections that you're going to maybe see that you never particularly saw before. Because, listen to me, God's people were rebelling against him. God has a plan for his kingdom. God needed a pair of ears to hear at a time when it was so, so important. And God saw this woman, Hannah, and I don't know what all she knew, why she had this burden, but I got a sneaky suspicion. She was seeing some things going on in the kingdom of God. And when she started to first cry out to God, it wasn't just about putting a baby in her belly. I'm telling you right now, because her plan was to give that baby back to God. See, God needed something. Hannah needed something and God needed something. God needed a pair of ears, listen to me church, that would hear him at a time when it was oh so important. Amen? Amen. Thank God for, for, for God's children that are obedient. John, look, thank God for Jesus. Amen? John 10, 17. Therefore does my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. What up? What an awesome word to have heard from his father and to have obeyed. My father loves me because I lay down my life so I can take it up again. And before we get into the story, you know, there's not many more precious things on this earth other than the word of God and the presence of God. Can you like it's more precious than diamonds and gold, my friend. It's more precious than material possessions. Y'all, y'all, I know y'all believe that. I know sometimes we get caught up in stuff. We all do. Okay, I can sit here and go on and on about Pastor Matt and the things he gets caught. But, but, but we do believe, right, that, that there really can be nothing more precious on this earth than the Word of God and the presence of God to lead us and to guide us in truth. Amen. You know, Proverbs 8, I love the Proverbs. And I don't really get to talk about them a lot, but I'm just going to read this proverb to you about wisdom. If you do Proverbs 8, if you do a study on it, you will probably come to the same conclusion I did. Somewhere in there, we're realizing that Jesus is wisdom. Somewhere he's the spoken word, then the eternal word that spoke the worlds into existence. Oh, I know it's calling, calling wisdom a sister. It's calling it's a female. But guess what? The Bible also says, how long did I try to gather you, Israel, like a hen gathering her chicks under her wings, but you would have none to do with me. The caring and compassion of El Shaddai, the full-breasted one that wants to nourish and to care for his people. Because there's an aspect of God the Father, of compassion and love that we can't even begin to understand. But this is what Proverbs does. She cries, does not wisdom call, does not understanding raise her voice. On the heights, beside the way, at the crossroads, 
She takes her stand. Is that not true? Almost everywhere that you go, driving down the road, every intersection, you'll see billboards. You'll see Jesus saves. You'll see bumper stickers. You'll see somebody standing on the side of the road, carrying a cross. Or everywhere that you go, you'll hear somebody witness. You'll hear a song in a store. Everywhere you go, wisdom is trying to cry out. She's trying to use her voice. And she's saying she's on the heights beside the way at the crossroads. She takes her stand beside the gates in front of the town at the entrance of the port. She cries aloud to you, O men, I call. And my cry is to the children of man. O simple ones, learn prudence. O fools, learn sense. Hear, for I will speak noble things, and from my lips will come the dry. Wisdom is crying out. Wisdom been crying out. Since the fall, wisdom has been crying out. And the message of truth has been spoken. And for whatever reason, sometimes people continue to ignore. So look, we're going to go ahead and try to move forward with this. I want to show you in this next. It says, in this man, Elkanah, he went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. So we see a man that's going to present himself before the Lord to do what people do. They go and they worship God. That's what, Now what do we do? We show up on Sunday and hopefully on Wednesday nights. And the reason that we're doing this is not to, not to keep some law, but to gather together. Because the word of God says forsake not the gathering of the brethren. That's why it's important for you to be able to find a house of God that you believe in, that you believe is preaching the truth. And you come to, and you, but you got it. The word of God says it. So don't get mad at me when I'm about to tell you. Forsake not the gathering of the brethren. The word of God, forsake not the gathering of the brethren. The Bible says to give your tithe unto the Lord. Whoa, what are you talking about? I'm talking about all the things in the word of God that we don't know about. Oh, that was the law. No, it wasn't. It was before the law. Bill just preached it before we got started. That's right. It was in Abraham. You know, one of the things I was telling Bill the other day is people don't want to hear about the tithes being before the law. I'm about to get fancy with you. Tithes were paid by Levi to Melchizedek while he was still in the loins of his father Abraham. That's some deep stuff right there. But let me just say something to you. If tithing went out with the law, then I guess salvation did too. Because the Bible says that God preached the gospel in advance to Abraham. When did he give it to him? Before he was circumcised. Before God gave the covenant to Abraham, he preached the gospel in advance to Abraham. Justification by faith was before the law ever was. Tithing was before the law ever was. See, we rob our own selves. The Lord said this, test me in this. Test me in this. See if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you are not even able to contain. One of the things that I find too, and this is how you're going to know, I'm about to really start trusting the Lord too. But this is how you're going to know that I'm just not really that worried about all that because look, well, you know what? The Lord wants me to keep moving. So here we go. We're going to keep going. I am going to go ahead and go back up here though and I want you to see this. We're going to talk a little bit about Hophni and Phinehas a little bit. Eli was very old. He kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel, how they laid with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And he said to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. So you can see what they're doing. Now, the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. The custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three pronged fork in his hand. How do you like that? It's almost like the mafia. You remember how the mafia would send people to the store and say, hey, pay your due. The, the servant of the priest had a three pronged fork and he just walked up there and look what he would do. He would thrust it into the pan, the kettle, or the cauldron of the pot, and all that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. So I just do want you to see that I felt like the Lord showed me this for the first time. The Bible tells us that Elkanah brought his wives to Shiloh every year to bring a sacrifice 
to the Lord. And now we're seeing that the people are trying to tell Eli what his sons are doing. So the word's out on the street of what's happening. So we can definitely assume that Hannah, ha I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to jump the gun here. I'm just trying to make a point. It's pretty likely that Hannah was aware that there was a lot of corruption going on in the kingdom of God. And that her heart was also burdened for the heart of God. Moreover, look at this. Before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. It gets even worse. Look at that. Before the fat was burned. And if the man said to him, Let them burn the fat first, then take as much as you wish, he would say, No, you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. Now, this is what the white of fat was important. You ready? Leviticus 3, 16 and 17. And the priest shall burn them on the altar as a food offering with a pleasing aroma. All fat is the Lord's. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwelling places that you eat neither fat nor blood. What is my point? My point is, is that the people that are functioning as priests of God have the written word of God and they could care less about the word of God. They're sleeping with women anywhere that they want to right out there in front of the house of God. They're, they sit in their servant over there with a three pronged fork, snatching the people's offering. They're even burning the fat of the sacrifice that specifically was told that it belonged to God. Thus, the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with the linen ephod. You see how he got the contrast, right? That the sin of these young men was very great. And then in the next verse, and Samuel, a little boy, was ministering before the Lord with a linen ephod. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about, right? The prayers that reach the hand of God. Now we're going back to this next verse. Going back to Hannah's life. I wanted to give you the context of what's going on. Now you see the context. And now in Hannah's life it says her adversary provoked her sore. You know what it's talking about? It's talking about specifically Penina or Penina. However you say her name. The other wife of Elkanah. Her adversary. But see you and I have an adversary. The word of God says in 1 Peter 5 and 8, it says that your adversary, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Look what her adversary was doing, provoking her sore to make her fret. Her enemy, her adversary was trying to poke at her, make fun of her, irritate her and trying to grieve her and her spirit. I got to tell you something that the enemy of your soul wants to do the same thing to you. He wants to come against you and he wants to provoke you and he wants to grieve you in your spirit. He wants to make you fret. He wants to weigh you down with a burden so that you cannot make a connection to God the way that God wants you to be able to make a connection. And look at this. To make a fret. Why? Because the Lord had shut up her womb. Yeah. Who, who shut up her womb? The Lord. The Lord shut up her womb. And again, she's got a burden on her heart. And I'm telling you that sometimes we don't understand why we don't get the answers to the things that we cry out for. And look what it says. And as he did so year by year. He didn't just shut up her womb one year. Her, year, her womb was shut up year by year. After year, yeah. after year, and every year that they went, Penina, Penina, however you want to say her name, yeah. keeps provoking her yeah. and trying to make her fret yeah. and trying to frustrate her and trying to irritate her. And many times as the children of God, I don't know about you, but I've been praying about some things and I just wish by the grace of God that my prayers be answered like that. And sometimes they're not. And, 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 and But you know what? God is worthy to be trusted. Right. And if he's going to put a burden on my heart, by the grace of God, I want to keep on trusting and I want to keep on praying and I want to keep on bombarding heaven and I only not want to pray for the things that I'm asking him to do in my life. I want to pray that his work would be done on the earth. When she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Look at this. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. 
I couldn't help but think about one of the Psalms. I think it's my next slide. Psalm 40, Psalm 42, 1 and 3. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Look at this, this is the part I want you to see. When shall I come and appear before God? I was thinking about Hannah and how she knew each year. See, it was different for them. You and I don't have to wait for next year. I'm pretty sure Naya said something last night about that. That they had to wait till they would get to the temple of God to offer sacrifice to worship the Lord. Jesus is our sacrifice. The veil was ripped. We have access to enter in. She had this to look forward to though. Each year she was going to go to the house of God. And look what the psalmist says. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food. Weeping, fasting, praying. My tears have been my food day and night while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? You know, can you not see uh, Panina, Panina doing that also to her? Where's your God, Anna? Over here, getting your little burden going, going to go there to the house of the Lord, do your little praying. Look at all look at the fruit of my womb. I'm just producing all these babies. And look at you. You all shut up. You're going to keep on praying to the Lord. I don't know what she was telling her, but she was provoking her. She was trying to make her fret. She was trying to make her sore and irritate her. And, and, and the same thing that was happening to David. Where is your God? And she was in bitterness of soul. And she prayed unto the Lord. And she went sore. I said this earlier in my message when I was talking, but let me say it again. Hannah did what believers are supposed to do. She's an example. She's a motherly example of what mothers are supposed to do. But if Matt Hebert would do what Hannah did, he'd be doing good as a servant of the Lord. What you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about whenever I'm of bitterness of soul. I'm talking about when I'm going through things. If I would do what Hannah did, if I would fast and weep and pray and not go back to the old ways, not try to go find some kind of comfort in something else that the enemy is offering, and instead to go to the Lord in, in my pain and in my... That, do do, do, do y'all do believe what I'm trying to tell you right now? That that's what believers are supposed to do? Now, if we're not believers... And we just showed up for Mother's Day. I understand. And we don't want to be believers. Okay. I, I understand if we just did an obligation. I get it. It happens. But if we are believers. And we want to serve God. Then when we find ourselves in times like this. Really and truly any time we find ourselves in any situation. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to Pray. We're supposed to seek God. We're supposed to fast. We're supposed to bring our burdens to the Lord. Cast your cares upon the Lord for he cares for you. We are not supposed to go to something else. Whatever something else is. You get along with the Lord on that for yourself. I'll get along with the Lord on that for myself. I'm just trying to tell you what a child of God is supposed to be. Amen. 1 Samuel 1 11, she vowed a vow. She said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your handmaid and remember me and not forget your handmaid, but will give unto your handmaid a man child, look at this, that I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. And look at this, this is interesting. And there shall no razor come upon his head. Now we're going to talk about that just in a second. But does that remind you of somebody else in the Bible? Samson. Samson. Thank you. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. But, 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 but isn't that interesting that she said, give me him so I can give him back to you. <laughs> She's not even asking for something selfishly. She said, no, if you, so that's what I'm trying to say. We've got to really kind of stop and think about this. Why does she have such a burden on her heart? To ask God for this male child. I believe. It doesn't say it in the text that I can find. But I believe with all of my heart. That God placed the burden on her heart. And I believe beyond the shadow of a doubt in my mind. That it's because of what I'm going to show you at the end. Because God needed somebody that was going to give him his ears. When he would speak. God needed some ears. That would listen. 
Now, I do want to tell you this. Number 6, 1 through 21 talks about the Nazarite vow. I'm not going to teach on it. You can go back and read it later if you want. But you know what the Nazarite vow is a type of? Sanctification. When a man or a woman willingly wants to separate themselves. And you know what's interesting is if you click on that, because I know some of y'all got that little olive tree app and y'all can look at the strongs. If you click on the word separated right there in Numbers chapter 6, like in the first couple of verses, you know what the word's going to have in there? Take a guess. Separation. Take a guess. Separation. Fasting from food. When you call a fact, you're separating yourself unto God. You're consecrating yourself unto God. You're saying, Lord, I'm going to do away with this because I am separating myself unto you. But that's not exactly what the Nazarite vow was. I'm going to tell you what the Nazarite vow was in a second. But that's what one of the words means. Part of the word means to separate oneself by fasting from food. So the Nazarite vow was this, is that they would not cut their hair. Now, it was a willing vow. It had to really, typically it was a person of age to make that decision, right? But Samson, the decision was made for him by his mom. And in this case, Hannah's saying, I'm going to offer him up to you. So they wouldn't cut their hair. They weren't allowed to eat grapes. They weren't allowed to drink wine. They weren't allowed to touch fermented things. They weren't allowed to touch dead bodies, right? And it was a separation vow that was only supposed to last a certain period of time. And then they could go back to doing their normal activities. But in Samson's life, he was a Nazarite from the get. And in this situation here, this is what the word of God says. No razor shall come upon his head. Now Hannah, she spoke in her heart only. So now she's at the temple. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she had been drunk. And Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put away your wine from you. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not your handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. God wants to know whenever you're going through things, Christian. You don't have to feel bad about bringing your burdens to the Lord. Right. Amen. He wants to hear the, the cry of your heart. And so I'm about to close this up with a few more scriptures. As a matter of fact, the music ministry, y'all can go ahead and come up. But I do, wanna, I do want you to try to pay attention to these last few verses because this is where I'm going to give you the connection. Okay. Jesus said seven times in the book of Revelation. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. So I want you to, so this is where we are. People of God aren't listening to the Lord. There's no open vision. The pro, there's no prophets really hearing from God. As a matter of fact, Samuel was the first prophet to be called a seer, to be able to see visions and to give prophetic words, right? Now the boy, I'm not saying he was the first prophet. I'm saying that the Bible calls him a seer. He's the first one that calls a seer. Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. He's a little boy. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had, had begun to grow dim. So you see the problem we have here, right? I know it's physically, but, but there's something going on here spiritually. The Bible is letting us know Eli can't see like he used to, and he was lying down in his own place, and it's, it's saying that the lamp of God had not yet gone out. If you read the King James Version, it says the lamp of God went out, but multiple newer translations says it had not yet gone out. And it's saying that Samuel was lying down before the temple of the Lord where the ark was. And many scholars believe that Samuel was actually doing the work on the lamp. The Bible teaches that they had to tend to the lamp every day. They had to trim the wicks. They had to fill it back up with oil. The idea is that Samuel is ministering in the temple, doing the work of the Lord. And he's a young boy. And look what it says. 
It says, and so he's in the presence of God. The Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of God. Then the Lord called Samuel, and look what he says. Here I am. He's got ears. He's got ears to hear. This actually happens three times. Samuel gets up, and he goes to talk to Eli, and he's like, did you call me, sir? He's like, no, I didn't call you. Go back and lay down. After the third time, Eli realizes this is the Lord. This is the Lord calling you. And he says, here I am. See, God is looking for somebody that will hear his voice. Whenever we're talking about the kingdom of God, or we're talking about the work of God, we got to understand that ultimately he was talking about Jesus. And I need you to understand that this was a very, very important time in the kingdom of God. Because the people of God, it said that there was no king and that the people did what was right in their own minds. And you know what they're going to start to do? The people at some point in the book of Judges are going to demand a king. Y'all remember that story? They're going to, as a matter of fact, it's in a few more chapters. They're going to demand a king. And God says he's going to go ahead and he's going to give them a king. But it wasn't his will because they were rejecting him as king. And you know, that's the story. He gives them Saul. Remember that? Because they said, we want to be like everybody else. We want a king. And the Lord said, they're rejecting me. They're not rejecting you. And he gives them Saul and they find themselves in misery because of that. And then now the time has come for the king that God has waiting for them. Do you, you get what I'm trying to say? I've used a lot of words this morning. So let me slow down just for a second to make sure you get the point. Nobody's listening to God. It's an extremely important time in the time frame of God's plan. And the people of God aren't listening to God. And he needs a pair of ears. He needs a pair of ears to hear because it's a very important time. Because he's about to bring the king on the stage that he had planned. Because out of this king, ultimately, will come Jesus. Look at the next verse. Well, I'm going to say it. Now Samuel, never, we're, we're transitioning. He's become a grown man. He's the prophet of God. He serves as the ears and the mouth of God for God to his people. This is the day that the burden was placed for this is the purpose of the weeping, the fasting, and the prayers. This is why ears to hear are so important to God. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him for reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons and it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said surely the Lord's anointed is before him but the Lord said unto Samuel look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature because I have refused him for the Lord sees not as man sees for man looks at the outward appearance but the Lord looks on the heart God needed a man to hear his voice and they called David from the field and he anointed David to be king that day and it was fulfillment of prophecy that had come hundreds of years before that to put the right king in the right spot so that the lineage of Jesus could come and I gotta tell you something church I believe with all of my heart I believe with all of my heart that we find ourselves in a time frame like no other. I know that other people have said these kinds of things before, I'm sure. I believe that we find ourselves in a time frame like no other. I believe we're in the end of the end. And I believe that God is looking for a people that would have ears to hear what he's saying to the church so that they would yield to him and allow his will to be done. Amen? Let's worship the Lord together. Praise God. If you need prayer, I want you to know the altars are open. Amen? Let's give the King glory. Amen?